So as Christianity started to grow in the second century, you get all of these differing ideas about what Christians should really be like and what they should believe and how they should behave. Um, I just talked about Marcion and his differing, differing ideas on these things. Another group that um, definitely influenced the growth of early Christianity uh, was a group um, just generically called the Gnostics. Um, this comes from a Greek word gnosis, meaning knowledge. And what you find uh, a similar trend within these groups is that they have um, a secret knowledge that you have to get by joining their particular group. And when you do join, they tell you all the secrets so that you can eventually um, get up to heaven and get to um, God. Now, I've given you a, a fairly long list of some of the common features, and I will warn you, uh, the Gnostics and the study of Gnosticism is a, a huge um, area of study in early Christianity, and we can spend an entire 10 weeks just talking about the Gnostics. So what I'm going to give you here in probably 15 minutes or less is just a, a very quick overview, and just be aware that this is really just a summary, and there's lots of other details we could actually cover. Um, I just mentioned that they have this um, belief that there's a secret knowledge that only um, their group has. And usually the secret knowledge comes from stories in the, the New Testament, usually from Jesus or the disciples. And I'll show you some examples here uh, in, in, I think, in the next slide. Um, what they tend to believe is that uh, matter is evil or uh, flesh is evil but that there is something called a divine spark, which is usually the human soul, um, which is also a piece of God, which is in every um, person. Now, in the beginning, this divine spark doesn't know what it is. So what the Gnostics believe is that this divine spark needs to be woken up. And it's woken up with this, this specific knowledge that you would get by um, joining these groups. And as I put here, this knowledge reveals the divine origin of the soul, and it really saves people. This knowledge will save people. Um, with this knowledge, your soul will get back to God, and this is normally by means of an ascent, meaning moving upwards. Um, in a lot of Gnostic groups, you have these uh, differing layers that you have to have, either the secret passwords to get to, or just secret knowledge to open up these different layers, and then you eventually get up to um, God. Um, I mentioned this briefly before for this number five, all, all the world, all the flesh, all of matter is evil. And it was ultimately created by an evil God, which I'll talk about in just a bit. And, and this includes the human body. And then eschatology was very big for these Gnostics. Um, when all of the divine sparks or souls are gathered up and they're informed about what they are and they make it through these various levels, then the, the uh, fleshly world will be destroyed. That's, that's their eschatology. Um, people knew about the Gnostics uh, before the 1940s, but it was mostly from material written by these early church fathers who wrote against them. And I mean, it's nice that they did that, but there's also some danger with, with totally believing in early Christian and what they had to say about the Gnostics. Um, this changed in the 1940s with the discovery of a group of Gnostic texts, and these are coming from a site in Egypt called Nag Hammadi. So they're usually called the Nag Hammadi texts. And these were found in a cave by a shepherd. He had been out looking for uh, bat guano, which was used as fertilizer, uh, came across this cave and came across this jar in the cave. Um, he broke it open and it was full of all of these uh, manuscripts. Um, let's see, I've got a picture of this. It's this guy here in the center who discovered uh, the Nakamati texts. So, and this is what they look like when they came out of the jar. Now, he didn't know what they were. Uh, they were uh, written in an Egyptian language called Coptic, which people don't use anymore. So he didn't know what these were. He took them back home. And unfortunately, part of the collection was destroyed when they were used as um, uh, tinder for a fire. So they ripped the pages out, threw them into the fire, uh, got their fire nice and hot, but they were actually destroying these early uh, Christian texts. Now, I've got the list here of uh, some of the, or actually all of the works that are found within the Nag Hammadi collection. And what you've got here are the codex. These are actually sort of, you can think of these as books, so codex one, codex two, and so on. 
um, what you might want to do is, is stop the video. And I will see if I can find a tag to the, the entire collection online. It's a little difficult to do that. Our textbook that we're using, uh, the primary source, will have some of these. So we'll talk about these uh, later on the discussion board. Um, so anyway, if you want to stop the video, you can take a look at all of these. And on this slide are uh, the rest of them. Mostly these are early Christian works, but I will say that uh, there's at least one that's um, from Plato's Republic, so they're not all Christian. More than likely what was going on uh, during this period is that there was probably a persecution of these Christians. Uh, they took their, their texts, they put them in a jar, put them in a cave, thinking that they would remember where they were, and maybe they were forgotten, or these people died, or they were killed, and uh, they weren't discovered until 1945. Now, you're probably wondering where this secret knowledge comes from, or where this idea even that there is secret knowledge. Um, the Gnostics, all they had to do was look at the New Testament. And I've given you here one, two, three, four, part, four parts uh, from the New Testament that talk about things um, that were kept secret. Um, so if you look at Mark 4, 33, um, with many such parables, Jesus, and he's talking about Jesus here, Jesus spoke the word to them and they were able to hear it. Um, he did not speak to them in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. So some early Christians like the Gnostics said, well, what exactly did Jesus say in private? So then they would write down what they thought he was um, saying. And then you get uh, Mark 13.3, uh, which probably isn't the best example, but you get these um, questions um, put, put to Jesus um, when he was asked uh, privately by Peter, James, and John, tell us, and so on. Now, the Gnostics look at that and say, okay, what else did they ask Jesus in private? So they would find sources, and they would write these um, things down. And then again, Luke uh, 9, 10, he took the apostles away, withdrew them privately to a city called Bethesda, uh, Bethesda and then talked to them. Um, you also see some interesting things in Paul that led to lots of discussion among these Gnostic groups. So Paul is probably talking about himself here in 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 1, where he says, I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Um, and then in the next verse, was caught up in paradise. Well, what is the third heaven? Uh, early Christians reading Paul didn't quite know what he meant. So the Gnostics, as, again, there's a huge group of Gnostics, uh, many of them said, well, this is what the third heaven is. There's obviously a first heaven, second heaven, third heaven, and so on. So it's the New Testament itself and some of these passages that are unclear that led to early Christians thinking uh, different, different ideas. Now, one group um, that we can talk specifically about are the Valentinians. Uh, these were a Gnostic group. And again, you know, just remember that the Gnostics were a very large or group of Christians. Um, one was the Valentinians. Now, they had a way of explaining how matter came into being um, and how this divine spark was, was saved. So, and unfortunately, I can't, I'm not standing in front of a board, so I can't write all this down for you. But um, according to the Valentinians, you have a series of emanations, or there's something called aeons from God. And what you've got is a pair of deities, uh, male and female. And then you get layers of emanations that are ultimately coming from God. So you got, um, I'm trying to write with this, it's not working very well, but God emanated these um, series of deities, uh, male and female. Now, for our purposes, um, the one that's important is Sophia. And so she shows up at the bottom of this list. And Sophia wanted to know um, everything about God and what was going on. Now, God had emanated these things, and by the time you get down to Sophia, she was feeling like she didn't know enough. And what happened, according to the Valentinians, is that this desire to know God became another God. It became another emanation. And this emanation is sometimes called the Demiurge or the Creator. Um, this is, for the Valentinians, the God of the Old Testament. So this God or this emanation created the earth and then created humans. And of course, remember that the Gnostics and the Valentinians believed that the earth and matter was, were evil. So um, this God who didn't know any better created the earth and created humans. 
Now, this is all because of Sophia um, and her desire to know. So um, I don't know if you know this, but Sophia is a Greek word, which means wisdom. So she wanted to know what was going on with God. Um, and this desire led to the creation of the earth, led to the creation of people, and this divine spark getting caught in, in the human, the evil human body. So what God decided to do was to emanate another series of gods. So this was the heavenly Christ and the Holy Spirit. So these came down, came down to earth, and they taught, um, first of all, they taught the aeons, this other group up here, all about God, because what God didn't want to happen again is to have another being emanate another world. So he didn't want that to happen. So ended up teaching the Aeons all about um, the true God, which of course was himself. And then you've got Jesus being sent down to um, the world to rescue humanity. And the way he did that is to teach them about what had happened and that the, the, the God that created the world, which is the Old Testament God, was the false God. So when the Valentinians taught that, they believed that this led their souls to be, uh, to be saved. Um, you've got a very famous uh, Gnostic writing called the Gospel of Truth, and this is probably written by Valent, uh, Valentinus. Um, this is um, just an image of one of the, um, the Nag Hammadi Codexes. This is the Apocryphon of John. So this is uh, sort of similar to Revelation of John, but um, the Apocrypha just means secret, the secret knowledge of John. And then what you get here, the whole point of me showing you this, is that um, the Gospel of Thomas comes right after this. And if you've heard about any of the Gnostic texts, it was probably the Gospel of Thomas. So what the uh, Gospel of Thomas is, is a series of sayings or logia. So remember, logos means word, logia means words. And what I've given you here are just a few of these. Um, and what you can do is stop the video and, and read through these. But the very first one says, whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. And then a lot of these are sayings of Jesus. So we don't know the ultimate source of these. It could be that whoever put uh, the Gospel of Thomas together knew Jesus and wrote down these sayings, or they're just a collection of sayings from uh, the time of Jesus. But anyway, you've got a whole series of these uh, very interesting statements by Jesus. Um, and then this, this part of the video has another section, um, especially oh, the reason I wanted to show you this is we'll talk about Mary Magdalene in, in, in a bit, where you've got Simon Peter saying, make Mary leave us for females don't deserve life. And Jesus says in a very interesting passage, he will make her male so that uh, she too may become a living spirit resembling males. And then this is interesting for every female who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. So. This, of course, led to more Gnostic ideas on what exactly this meant about females being made into males and getting into heaven. Um, this leads to our discussion about the Gospel of Mary Magdalene or the Gospel of Mary. Um, I just want to let you know this is not found in the Nag Hammadi section. Um, and your, your primary textbook has the Gospel of Mary in there, which I'd like you to read. Um, this is part of the manuscript here. Uh, discovered in the late 1800s, um, and it's been um, becoming more and more popular here in the last 20 years. Now, Mary Magdalene is discussed in the New Testament, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, uh, about her, her roles. You can, um, I've given you here the passages in the Old Testament where she's mentioned, where she's uh, mentioned as a visionary and a leader. Uh, you can certainly look, look these things up. Now, the Gospel of Peter um, is... Uh, um, one of the texts that you can certainly look up, and I believe it's in your primary textbook as well. Um, in the Gospel of Mary, so I mentioned a few weeks ago that, that Mary Magdalene was originally um, or later pegged as a prostitute and so on, which of course was totally false. Um, the group of Gnostics who, who either created the Gospel of Mary or who used it in their worship certainly liked Mary. And what I'd like you to do is to stop the video and to read through them some of these things, and I'll point out some of some of these ideas. Okay, now that you've read it, you can see Mary was a leader, so she she stood up, greeted all of the apostles, and then said 
um, uh, these things that you can read here. Um, she turned their hearts to the good, and then they began to discuss the words of the Savior or Jesus. Um, you can see here, Peter says, we know that the Savior loved you more than the rest of women. Uh, tell us the words of the Savior, which you remember. So clearly Mary herself, Mary Magdalene, has this knowledge that she wants to, that the, the apostles want her to give to them. And then she says, what is hidden from you, I will proclaim. So again, this is a, a key indicator that this is a Gnostic text. Um, now, you do have some discussion in the Gospel of Mary about people who do not believe her. So Andrew says, um, I at least do not believe that the Savior said this, for these are strange ideas. Um, and then you've got Peter in this particular store. Did he really speak privately with a woman? and not openly to us. Uh, Mary was clearly upset about this. Mary Magdalene was upset. And then she says, what do you think? Uh, do you think that I've thought this up on my own or that I'm lying about the Savior? Um, and then Levi stands up for Mary and says, Peter, you've always been hot tempered. So clearly the group that was reading this had a high regard for Mary Magdalene. And that's why this text is, is so important. Um, you also have Mary Magdalene mentioned in, in other um, uh, books from Nag Hammadi, and at least one book, the Pista Sophia, so um, the belief of the faith of Sophia, um, Mary Magdalene is mentioned in there. But if you want to read more about Mary Magdalene and these Nag Hammadi, you can certainly uh, find them in these books. Um, I mentioned this before a few weeks ago about the mistaken associations of Mary Magdalene. Um, it's sometimes thought she's the, the unnamed sinner who is anointing Jesus' feet. Um, she's sometimes confused with another Mary. Unfortunately, there's Mary of Bethany, there's Mary the mother of Jesus, there's Mary Magdalene, and sometimes they're just called Mary in uh, the New Testament. And again, this is probably the more important one. She's um, confused with the adulteress in John 8, 1 through 11. And uh, also with a Syrophoenician woman who has five or more husbands. So she is mistaken for that. She gets a really bad re reputation in early Christianity because it's believed that this is her.